And welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. Glad to have you with us again. And uh, I'm glad to be here. And I'm glad to have this guest. Uh, we connected online, again, on Twitter, which has been a wonderful supply, uh, supply line for me for guests. And um, when I saw his name, I knew right away that he was from a Jewish and Israeli background family. And I was, I piqued my interest right away. And we connected and uh, we've, we've spoken a couple of times, both uh, on the phone and through email. And my guest today is uh, Dr. Gamali Elbear uh, with an EDD, a doctorate in education. He joined Howard County Fire Department of Fire and Rescue Services in 2008. From 2008 until 2018, he served in the field as a firefighter EMT. He spent five years at the busiest engine company and five years with Special Ops Division. While in Special Ops, he developed an underwater remotely operated vehicle, a UROV program for the fire service. The team has been used for regional responses and has conducted four body recoveries since it was lost, launched three years ago. In January of 2018, during his doctoral studies, he was invited to serve at the Howard County Department of Fire Rescue Services. I think that's the abbreviation of those initials. Yes. And um, he, is, he has been doing that, and, but he also continues. He is, um, uh, I just lost, it. sorry. He is, in, right, and, and to, where he launched in that department a health and wellness program. As a certified health coach, a certified personal trainer, and a credentialed peer supporter, he led the peer fitness program and the peer support program and taught health and wellness in the fire academy. While at headquarters, he led the peer support team through the department's first career line of death. In the summer of 2020, he returned to the field but continues to teach and consult on health and wellness for both individuals and organizations. Since 2017, Dr. Baer has volunteered as a National Fallen Firefighters Foundation state advocate. He represents the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation both locally and nationally, the charity that is very dear to our hearts here at Five Alarm Task Force in the fire service education and advocacy, as well as special projects development. He was a founding member of a permanent public safety health and wellness support group for the state of Maryland. He has delivered education and presentations at the local, state and national levels, levels as keynote speaker, breakout room speaker and panelist. He continues to participate in podcasts and webinars. Thankfully, he's here. Since 2012, Dr. Bayer has served as a Coast Guard reservist. He enlisted as an intelligence specialist and in 2016 received his commission as an officer. He served as an emergency preparedness liaison officer to FEMA's National Response Coordination Center and was activated during the triple hurricanes of 2017, where he helped to coordinate critical life safety missions for Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. He is now an intelligence officer at the US Coast Guard Intelligence Coordination Center, which is the Coast Guard Strategic Intelligence Analysis and Production Center. And if folks, if you down in Florida and you heard the news last night, the U.S. Coast Guard, one of their cutters, brought in over $400 million of confiscated drugs and about 50 uh, of the bad guys who were purveying it. Dr. Bear is currently working on two book projects on health and wellness for the fire service. He has been married for 17 years to Dr. Nan Bear, who has a, a, a farm, um, the, a doctorate in phar pharmacology and pharmacist. They have three children and one on the way. He holds a BS in marketing from the University of Maryland, College Park, an MS in management from John Hopkins University, and his EDD in organizational change and leadership from the University of Southern California, where he earned the Dissertation of the Year Award. In March of 2020, he received his Chief Training Officer designee from CPSE. He is a mentor to doctoral students at the University of Southern California, firefighters in his department, and the National Fallen Firefighters Advocates around the nation. Dr. Dr. G, or G as they, you, call, you told me they call you, welcome to the podcast. So happy to finally have you with us. Thanks, Steve. It's, it's nice to be on here with you. Thank you. So we've talked, and uh, you've heard some of the podcasts as well, and you know that the focus of our podcast, uh, the, 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 really the pillar of what we stand on is firefighter health, wellness, fitness for duty, as well as the cancer and behavioral health awareness initiatives. And I think that what you're bringing to this podcast, 
actually encompasses that mission statement of our podcast. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm very passionate about health and wellness in the, in the fire service and just in general as well. Well, I think that um, the broad scope of all the degrees you've earned and what you've concentrated on and the fact that today you're still uh, a devoted advocate for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Um, it's one of, personally, it's one of my first charities that I donate to. Um, all the, uh, the um, royalties that we got from the old t-shirts that we sold here on the, on the podcast um, and from my book that was published in Kindle on Amazon, I've donated to the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation because it was a book about how this kid, me, who was planning to be a rabbi, uh, wound up in North Carolina as a Hebrew school director and wound up as a volunteer firefighter and then going on into EMT and beyond that. So it, it's, there's, there's a good strong bond between us. And, uh, That's right. and I'd like to really talk about how your dissertation focused on the concept of heart attack, cancer, and suicide prevention. And one of the things that we've talked about here um, is the fact that, especially after the fact, in other words, a lot of firefighters after they're retired out or disabled out, like I was, um, come upon a rough, rough time in that life. And it's not just firefighters. We know it's police officers as well. And even our brothers and sisters in EMS, it's happening too. There's burnout. 2020 is going to be known for one thing, the wildfire of COVID and the absolute sacrifice of our first responders from our dispatchers who take those first calls to our call takers really to our dispatchers, to our firefighters, uh, EMS personnel and law enforcement who respond, transport these people to the hospitals, and then the magnificent people at the hospitals, the doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, uh, the, the janitorial staff, the cleaning people, everybody, the radiology department, everybody there has given 10,000% during this pandemic. So briefly, to just to kick us off, how do we, how do we try to calm our people who are burnt out. Of course, last night we had the big snowstorm through the Northeast. Uh, most, most of us, if you watch the news, saw that. Ter Luckily, nobody was injured, but that horrible accident just outside of Pittsburgh where that, that uh, pickup truck skidded and hit right into the back of an EMS rig outside of mm. Pittsburgh. And at least all the rescuers who were already on the scene of that previous accident were able to get out of the way. But those calls came in, people driving crazy as they do in a storm. They still have to go out. And these, these men and women in emergency services, all branches, and we can't really forget also our road rangers on our highways and our, um, our recovery operators because they're, they're a part of every accident, basically, that we have to go to. So how do we start calming them down and take them off this ledge of the burnout working one doctor in uh, the Midwest, I think it was Indiana, working 256 straight days in the ER. How do we calm them down? How do we assuage what they're, they're feeling inside? Yeah, it's a good question, Steve. I, I don't know that there's anything that we can tell them necessarily that will make them feel better. I, I certainly can't predict the end of COVID. But what I can say is, um, you know, there's this, quote that's attributed to Aristotle. It's, um, we are what we repeatedly do. You've probably heard that before. Yes. And what Aristotle is trying to say is we, we are the sum of our actions. You know, we don't become who we are because we did something one time. We become who we are because we've done something over and over and over again. And we, and we've built a habit to become that, um, in, um, in sort of social psychology, uh, field, there's a guy, uh, Bandura, and, um, and he talks about how there's, there's a major impact that causes us to do what we do. And so I like to say, when I hear the phrase, we are what we repeatedly do, that yes, that's true, but uh, we do what we repeatedly see and hear. 
And so what I could tell somebody to maybe help calm them down is to reflect on what they're looking at and listening to or what they're exposing themselves to on their downtime. You know, there's nothing you can do for an emergency doctor or an emergency worker um, who's who's stuck in the emergency room day in and day out with with COVID issues that they're dealing with. They unless they quit their job, you can't you can't tell them to just calm down. But what you can say is, hey, are you coming home and are you spending two, three, four hours online on Twitter, on Facebook, reading you know news that is making you more anxious or you know, listening to music that's making you more anxious or isolating yourself. And so that's where I think Bandura would say the way you choose what you do and then become who you are is based on, you know, what we expose ourselves to, what we're, what we're watching t- on TV, what we're listening to on the radio, what we're looking at on our phones now and who we're spending our time with. And granted, there's a whole other side of the conversation, which is genetics. There's a huge genetic impact that makes us who we are. Uh, some folks, uh, especially Robert Floman, who just wrote this book, Blueprint, it's a big controversial book now, but uh, he talks about how up to about 50% of who we are and what we do actually comes from our genetics. But there's, there's a lot left over for sort of the nurture side of the argument. And so that's what I would say is, is to have people reflect on what it is they're exposing themselves to day in and day out and maybe tune down a little bit of the stuff that makes you more anxious and you, and you know what that is. Most people understand what that is. And if you, and if you don't ask a friend or a loved one and they could probably tell you. You know, that's, that's a good point. It's interesting when our older daughter was able to come down uh, last month, it's been a few weeks, uh, every morning uh, she would uh, go out to our the, the screened in patio if it wasn't raining. And um, she would spend about 10 minutes meditating. She had an app on her phone that coaches her through a meditation and when she comes back and she's all fine and ready to start the day and everything like that and it's interesting because i've tried to i didn't use an app right then i've tried to sometimes just sit in the living room and just kind of clear my head but i have a d- difficult time i have a lot of thoughts that are constantly running running through there and so uh for me, it's, uh, I look forward to the sleep in the evening that I can try to get. Uh, but when you said what we repeatedly do strikes home uh, to me and my family, because uh, even though I became medically disabled from the fire service in, in 81, uh, in 85, and then that back injury that we talked about the other day in 92, um, I have always kept a BLS bag in my car and I oh, wow. always stopped at any accident or emergency on the road if there was no nobody else there and wow. I've crawled through crawled through cars I've been in the back seat holding someone's neck for 22 minutes uh, just sitting there and you know people have asked me well how, with your back injury how can you do it well all that I said well when the adrenaline as soon as I see it happen there have been several that have happened in front of me the adrenaline pops. I my I tell my wife she knows to call nine one one or if it's one of my one of my our daughters who happen to be with me, they've done they call nine one one. They know how to give the location to the call takers, and I'm gone. I already have the bag on, and uh, you know the story that my oldest one likes to tell is I had, we had just finished I had officiated a service in Lakeland, Florida for the high holidays, and was finished Yom Kippur, the holiest day, the Day of Atonement. Uh, for those of you who aren't Jewish, the holiest day in the Jewish year. And we're driving home on I-4, and suddenly I see a dust up and water spray in front of us. And it's pouring. And um, as we got closer, I saw our car overturned in the median, and the median was one of those belly, you know, belly one like this. And so there was water, several inches of water. Oh, wow. there. And I saw two two people and then uh, uh, another car stopped with four, four young men in it. And they, they saw me and they said, do you need help? And I said, yeah, come with me. And we got, there were two girls, uh, this one, the driver's two daughters were out, but she was hanging upside down in her seatbelt and the water was coming up her forehead already. So wow. I had them lean against the car and I quickly did an assessment inside, you know, inside wearing, I'm wearing 
my suit jacket, a tie, white shirt inside, suit pants, and I'm sopping wet already. But, you know, and I asked, does she have any medical issues? And she said, high blood pressure. She said she has a, 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 a cardiac rhythm issue. So uh, a, a trooper comes in the rain. He's all dressed up. And I said, uh, call in and see if, if we can get a trauma alert from here because I may need a trauma alert. And he says, well, who are you? And I just showed him my badge. I said, I'm a former firefighter medic. I just, uh, but I, I have somebody trapped in here. We're going to get her out. But based on what I've just assessed, we might need a trauma medic. I don't know if you can get, they'll fly in this weather, but find out for me. Otherwise, get an ambulance here ASAP. So he goes, well, they're on the way. I said, okay. And then one of the fire districts sent in. But by that time, we had removed the woman from the car um, uh, and a sister there and then we did, we just all all five of us took her and moved her to my car to get her out of the rain and I, I was able to take her vitals and stuff there and she was she was well enough that we could tr transport away you know by by vehicle in, in the storm but my when i got back in the car um the tr the trooper didn't like didn't like me because i get, i asked him to do something but the 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 re, the re, first responders the other first responders who showed up in the uh, when the rescue and the engine company were were terrific and and um, but my daughter said how could you do that with your back I said because the adrenaline is still pumping the adrenaline is better than either the the medication pump or the stim wave I have in me because that just fires me up it's like it lights the fire in the belly that's what happens right and sure you know ten minutes later when we're all finished. We were driving back to, towards her apartment, and the adrenaline subsided. I knew I was hurting, but I, there was nothing that would let me go past that accident. All right, it was right in front of me, and not try to help. And you know, I've done it. My family says over a hundred times that they know of together, and it's just because it's it's who I am. You know, I never intended to be a firefighter. I was seven years old the first time I saw my fire at first fire engine close up. There was a little grass fire in the woods behind the house. The guys were great. The, the captain was a really nice guy and gave me a lollipop when I was walking. And I took me around the end, showed it. And that moment sort of kind of like uh, solidified in my mind how special firefighters were. And uh, I started having my parents drive me to all the stations in our community. And then when I could ride my bike, I rode to the surrounding communities. And when I could drive my car, I went through Greater Boston and visited most of the Boston firehouses, Brookline, Cambridge, all that area. And, you know, on social media, I always give an extra boost to my Boston for Jakes and my Cambridge Jakes and the Jakes of Massachusetts because they were the ones who shaped me. I never was going to be a, a firefighter. I just, you know, plan on being a rabbi. That's what I wanted to do and teach families. But, the, you know, life took me on a little bit different path. And uh, I just went by the station one day, on the sec second day or third day after we moved in to go to the grocery store to pick up some stuff. And I saw a big brick building with big doors and big shiny red trucks inside. So I stopped in to look through and half hour later, I walked out with an application. <laughs> so, and that's where, what it was. And I think that there are many of us who, uh, and listen, I, I got to also say that it was the TV show Emergency that made, had a big influence on my life as well. Again, didn't change my direction because I was still in college when it came out and watching it there, but it just showed me that the admiration I had for the men and women in the fire service and, and rescue and, and the police and, and EMS as it was going up at the time, and, and Emergency was a great example of what was happening with EMS. Uh, in this country, right. was guided me and thousands of others to this vocation or avocation in my case. Uh, well, and now you're guiding others with your show. Well, I hope. I mean, I hope that people listen. We know that not every listener is an active emergency worker. They, some are buffs and they like the fire service as I did. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, my guests can impart to any listener, something that takes hold of them inside and in their mind, then I view that podcast, whether it's the audio or the video, as a success. I don't have to 
please 500 people. I need to right. hopefully that my guests will influence at least one of my one of my listeners to change something, to learn something, to do something uh, that's inside them, and um, and to also to know that what they're doing is deeply appreciated, and it's not just from the people they see in their communities that they've dedicated their lives to. It's there are dozens of firefighter podcasts out there on on social media today, and um, we're just one, but every one of them is there to impart something. That's right. That's what it's about. Um, and I think that uh, it's our job, whether we're active, retired, disabled, whatever, um, to remember what we did, what we do, and why we do it, and why we did it. If you hold on to those in your heart and in your mind, and sometimes that people, as you know, have to be counseled to get to that, get to make that move. That it's okay to feel good about what you did. You may not be in it anymore, but it's still good. You did help people while you were doing the job, any of those jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And and maybe that will help cut down the, some of the numbers that we're seeing, and I'm sure you saw in, in your research for the dissertation. Uh, and as we talked about the other day, that. Um, you know, in, I think it was, I think Jeff said that it was in 2019, we lost more firefighters to suicide than we did to active duty incidents. And that's sad. Yeah. That's sad. And we need, and it hopefully is. that this new push of our behavioral health awareness and what you're doing, what you're doing with your teaching um, and your influencing, uh, I think, is a great effort to help our brothers and sisters in emergency services, no matter the branch, uh, to know that, yeah, it can be trying and difficult at times. Uh, you helped with Puerto Rico. You know, I can't even imagine what you had to deal with after the, the hurricane there. Um, we saw in Houston a couple of years ago, uh, how difficult it was for emergency workers, yet they came from around the country. You had citizens who brought boats to Houston on trailers. They brought them there so they could help rescue people, try to save their homes, whatever they could do. And these weren't even trained emergency workers. These were just citizens who said, hey, we came to help. I, I came from Alabama. I came from Mississippi. Uh, they just came from all over to help the people in Houston. And so I That's think right. many of us, whether we join emergency services as a vocation or, or as an avocation, whether your career, volunteer, part bay, makes no difference. We have that magic gene in us, as do doctors and nurses and health workers and psychiatrists, psychologists, educators, that says, that gene tells us, you're going to help somebody some way. So let's get into a little bit more about the organizational development of what you've learned, what you see for, let's, we'll focus initially on the fire service, because that's really where this part of your education is so important uh, in your dissertation. And by the way, I, I apologize for not having seen that sooner, but congratulations on the dissertation of the year from uh, UC. Yeah, appreciate that, that, it. That's an amazing honor to have received. That's great. Thank you. Is it published, I hope? Oh, yeah, it's out there. Okay. Yep. So a after the show, you'll tell me the name so I can look it up. And uh, sure. I'd be very interested in reading it. So let's talk about this. So how do you see the organizational impact on these issues that we're facing today in emergency services? Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, I have, um, I have to say that it's now – most fire services, I, I think, most fire departments now are talking at least a little bit about the health and wellness issues that, that exist. And um, heart attack, cancer, suicide, those are the three big ones that people are talking about. So at least I think now after probably a few decades of people who were doing a lot of the groundwork have gotten the fire service to the point where at least they're talking about it. The next question is then what is an organization supposed to do about it? 
Um, there's guidance out there at the national level. Um, I think the first, the first step, sort of like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, is just admitting that there's a problem, right? So fire services, fire service departments, first responder departments, um, they have to admit that there's a problem, look at themselves and, and do some sort of assessment and see where are they at and are they following standards, national standards, guidelines, um, and do they even recognize what the problem is? And so I do think that it's important for um, some distinguishment to happen. And what I mean by that is, you know, on the one hand, you have firefighters, fire service organizations, they're pounding their fist and they're saying that firefighters are, they're dying so much more from these issues than the general population uh, or some sort of mixture of that statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the issue, the first issue that uh, fire service, um, departments have to figure out is what are the statistics and what are people dying from? And so if you look right now at the general population, um, most of uh, the top deaths in America are actually heart attack and cancer. Right. So um, if you go to the CDC's website, the number one overall death is heart attack and, it's, and the number two overall death is cancer. Uh, that being said, if you look at uh, the data from the lens of where firefighters would fit in that data, because not everybody from age 10 to 80 is a firefighter. And, you know, the way the CDC collects data is they collect all age ranges, but then they break it up into different age ranges. So when you collapse the data into what's a normal firefighter age, and the best you can get with the CDC data is from like 15 years old to 64 years old. Those are, it's broken up into segments, but the, but the closest to the youngest age, they don't have like an 18 age group. It's 15 to 24 is the first age group. And the last age group is 55 to 64. So if you just collapse it down to that, 15 to 64, um, cancer actually becomes the number one, heart attack becomes the number two, and uh, you have unintentional injury, which is its own category. That becomes number three. Guess what becomes number four, Steve? Suicide? Yeah. It goes up from number 10 at the, at the all age group. Uh, it goes up to number four when you look at ages 15 to 64. And so the reason I bring that up is because, yes, heart attack, cancer, and suicide is affecting the fire service, but it's also affecting the general population as the number one, two, and four killers for the for the closest age group that would represent the fire service. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Sadly, it does. And, and um, uh, you know, we, we have a mutual friend, Todd LaDuke. Uh, we, Todd's podcast was just released, his latest podcast. He's been a great friend for a number of years, and he's been on several times. And uh, we, we talk about uh, some of the great people out there. Um, as you and I talked to the other day, the team that I know from University of Miami, uh, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Centers, um, uh, Dr. Denise Smith, Dr. Sarah Janke, and all these great yep. people who are really working hard to help us in these issues. And uh, as Todd does now with LifeScan Wellness Centers as the Chief Strategy Officer, his goal is, isn't just his goal now. He's been doing this already. He brought it to Broward County during the, the decade year that they've been having life right. there. And he has amazing stories, not just from Broward County, but from Miami-Dade and from around the country of how LifeScan's motto, we save America's heroes, is so true. Because whether it's from their, that three hour test they have, it's not just a physical assessment, it's not just a cardiac assessment, but it's a character assessment. It's how are you doing as a person assessment? And that's where they have been able to find early signs of any of those levels and help mitigate that. And we have great survivor, survivor stories because of that. That's right. And I think that some of the people that I mentioned are working towards that same goal with what you just said. How do we, the, the one thing we can't change is what can happen on an emergency scene that's unexpected. We can't change right. it. We have to be ready for it. As a matter of fact, we have a, a webinar coming up in, in the end of January 
of a mayday, mayday, what do you know? Do you know what to do if you're not on the mayday? Because our, you know, our initial response is if we hear a mayday call, and you know, it's different today because everybody, every firefighter on the ground has a radio. When I was in, there were only two radios on an apparatus, one that was screwed into the dashboard and one that the officer had, the handy talking. So our signs were either, the only signals we go, either somebody yelling at us or the air horns going off to get the hell out of the building. Today, every firefighter has the opportunity, God forbid, to push that mayday button. But our initial response, and we saw this in the tragedy in Worcester in 1999, um, until the chief made the most difficult decision he probably ever made in his life when he stopped any other firefighters from going into the cold storage building. Mm -hmm. But our initial thing is, I got a buddy down, I got to go over there and help. But if you're right. not on the RIT team and you didn't call the mayday, you can't just abandon your position to go and help. And that's what right. our set webinar is going to be about. We have two battalion chiefs, a captain, and a very well experienced firefighter who's the co editor and co founder of the Firehouse Tribune. And they're all addressing these. These particular issues, we're not talking about what to do in the May Day in general. How do you call? No, we know that. Everybody's trained for that. But we found that few people, and even the battalion chiefs have said, you know what? We never really addressed that with the, the, the group. What, is there, what do they do if the May Day goes off? And they're not on the Ritter right. team. And it, it, I call it the first domino. There's always a first domino that falls. And when it does, it never falls alone because there are other dominoes with it and it knocks down, knocks the other ones down. And when you're the first one down on the fire ground, whether it's because it was simply, you fell through the floor that you didn't expect and you sound the mayday, or you know you have health problems, but you want to be, you know, the most popular guy in the firehouse in that shift and I want to go through the door first and you go through the door and you collapse with chest pain, you're the dom first domino that knocks all the other dominoes down. And we have, to, mm -hmm. we have to be able to keep those other dominoes. Cert, certain dominoes have to go and take care of that first domino, but everybody else has to do what they need to do on that emergency scene. We can't just stop a rescue. We just can't think the fire is going to go out because we're, we have to go help a, a brother or a sister. Right. You know? And that, I think that also plays a heavy part. Is um, uh, Chief Don Abbott, who's retired, has an amazing site on the May Day project that he's done. And the number of May Days that we hear a month that they track is amazing. Amazing. Wow. Now, some of them are missteps and some of, our, some of them are, most of them are actual emergencies. But we still need to teach our people how to handle, we go out on every emergency that we're toned out on. But sometimes we have an emergency. And we have to be able to be as professional as we are to our community for our own people as well. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, Steve. I think that's uh, you hit it on the head there where I'll just kind of uh, say back what you just said, which is we have to teach our own people how to deal with um, issues. And that's, the same applies to health and wellness too. And I think that's where... Uh, to circle back to the organization, the question is what, you know, a lot of times, I don't mean to go off topic here, but going back to the uh, quote by Aristotle where he said, we are what we repeatedly do. You hear that a lot from uh, upper officers or people up in that higher end of the chain because they want the individual to realize that they have some sort of responsibility. But the thing is, those individuals have come into an organization, they've been taken in. And the organization has to remember that they actually have responsibility as well. And in fact, they have the first responsibility, which is they took, they've taken this person off the street into the organization and they're going to develop this person to be what they need to be, a firefighter, EMT, whatever. Um, I think it's, it's time now that organizations realize that part of that development and part of that responsibility is teaching firefighters how to take care of themselves in the sense that uh, they don't end up having a heart attack, getting cancer or suicide from lifestyle issues. 
sort of like you said, there's going to be unexpected things from the job. We're going to get exposed to things we never wanted to get exposed to. If we're wearing our SCBA and our PPE the right way, we'll limit 90% of that stuff, maybe more. But there's always going to be something there, um, you know, a falling object, some fumes or, you know, exposure, toxic exposure, whatever, or some sort of scene that we just can't get out of our mind. That's always going to be a part of our job. We can't reduce all of that completely, at least not now. But what we can start doing is uh, organizations can take a proactive role in preparing their firefighters, just like you're talking about for RIT. Um, what are we doing right now as an organization to prepare firefighters so that they have the knowledge um, and the ability to prevent lifestyle issues from leading to a heart attack on the job or leading to cancer. Um, and what we're seeing right now is that a lot of the issues, that especially heart attack with Denise Smith, what she's doing, Dr. Smith and, uh, and her teams, she's, she's basically showing fire, the fire service as a whole that so many of our on-duty deaths from heart attack are from lifestyle issues. Something like 90%. Right. Are Firefighters, we're still, this, the latest year that came out, the fatality report has something like 54% of medical or overexertion or stress, something like that. And um, 90% of that is self-inflicted. That's, it's not because the fire service did it to us. There's another uh, major report out, not from Dr. Smith, but it's, it's from um, Houston's uh, Anderson Cancer Center. Sure. And I cited it uh, in some of what I teach. And they say 90% of cancers are lifestyle or environmental is the way they classify it. The biggest one or one of the biggest ones being obesity and diet. And we know that there's a major problem in the fire service with obesity. In fact, um, uh, Dr. Jenke, Sarah Jenke's group did a whole research paper on that. And they said firefighters are just as obese, if not even slightly more than the general public. And uh, last year or the year before, the CDC said that uh, they've now hard linked like 13 cancers to obesity. And there's like 200 cancers. So there's a lot of cancers out there. But a lot of the cancers that the fire service is looking at are these abdominal cancers, which are highly affected by obesity. And we know that the fire service is obese, just like the general public. So those are some of the things that I think the organizations have to start looking at and saying, look, yeah, we don't want cancer. We certainly don't want it from an organizational um, liability perspective if it comes from the job. But at the same time, you know, as an organization, they have to protect themselves and say, you know, we want to stop all cancers that we can. We don't want anybody having cancer, especially if it's lifestyle, because that means we're taking on responsibilities that we don't really have to in that sense. And if we're teaching them how to stop it, we won't have to deal with that. You know, at least we'll reduce the amount that we have to deal with. Um, because so many of those cancers, as far as the Houston Cancer, cancer uh, Anderson Cancer Center says, are, you know, reducible based on lifestyle issues, whether it's uh, drugs or alcohol or obesity or smoking or whatever, diet-related factors. Um, that's a huge area that we can start to tackle now as a fire service. And the same goes for um, suicide. If you look at um, the suicide rates for this year and published in NFPA, it was, um, I think it was over 120, uh, you know, suicides this year. If you count firefighters and EMTs, it might've been 140. Um, and what we're seeing in the general public, again, is suicide numbers are increasing. Um, and the number one group, well, actually, the number one group is um, is like uh, Alaskan natives and um, Pacific Islanders or, or uh, you know, Native American. It's a very small, tiny sliver of the absolute numbers, but they're the highest uh, at risk group for suicide. But the but the largest group by absolute numbers and the second most by percentage is actually white males. So their numbers of suicide are the highest, which is like double the national rate. And we don't talk about that a lot, but guess who makes up the majority of the fire service? White males. White males, which is double the national, the population average. So when we go around slamming our fists on the table and saying, well, firefighters are, you know, dying by suicide more than the general public, we have to look at those numbers and parse them out a little bit. And that's really what I was trying to do in my dissertation and what I'm trying to do to, to challenge fire services and also uh, fire, fire departments and also individuals that say, look, let's look at these numbers. 
yes, we do need to address some of the stuff. Yes, a lot of it can be attributed to fire ground, you know, uh, boogie monsters, but not all of it. In fact, the large majority of it probably is not. The large majority is probably lifestyle. And if we're not addressing that, then we're losing the game before we even enter the game because firefighters are bringing a lot of this stuff into the, into the department with them. And that's why, you know, um, what, uh, what Todd LaDuc is doing with LifeScan is, is so great, but not every department can afford that. Right. But, at, but every department can afford to do a little bit of education if they're already doing initial or continuing training in their department. You can afford to add in 30 minutes or an hour of, of something to, to give people a little bit of information to take that home with them and, and maybe change their lifestyle a little bit. I think that's an important point. And I think where it, it needs to start is that, you know, in the, whether it's the academy or you're training in a volunteer department uh, and they have a little ground, ground area that you work at, you can't just teach tactics anymore. That's, that's what the academies and the training does. It teaches us tactics to be firefighters doesn't teach us anything about the job. It just teaches us right. tactics and how to do this, know this piece of equipment, how to do that, know this piece of equipment, how to use it, et cetera. It doesn't talk about lifestyle. It doesn't talk about what you can see, what you're gonna see uh, on, on the scene. Uh, I can guarantee that every single firefighter with two years or more has one call that they'll, they, will remember throughout their life. Uh, my buddy mm -hmm. and I, I met this when I joined that department in North Carolina. It was uh, that night that the, being voted in was the end of uh, Simchat Torah. And I told the chief, I don't think I can be there because I'm at the synagogue, it's the Jewish holiday. He says, Mr. Green, if you want to be on this department, you better have your ass in that chair, in that room. So I ran, I got my custodian to lock up for me. I ran to the firehouse. Of course, I couldn't find a parking space. I was the last one to walk in. There was only one chair left in the front row. And I had to sit there and I sat next to this young kid. He's wearing a torn t-shirt and, and, and gym shorts. And I go, hi, he goes, hi, he goes. He looks at me, he goes, oh my God, were we supposed to dress up for this? I said, didn't you get the memo? He goes, no, no. He goes, oh my God. One more. I said, calm down. I'm only kidding. I just came from the synagogue. He goes, synagogue, you Jewish? And I said, yeah. He goes, I'm Jewish too. And we met. That was 1977. He's still my best friend today. He's the chief pilot for one of the sh sheriff's offices in, in the state of Florida. And I mean, he stood up for me. He saved my life at least twice. Uh, I saved his probably twice. We went on, I would say, 85% of the calls that we responded on, we were, we were together on, on the same app wow. to do it. And it just was the tie. He was one of my business partners in uh, Dalmatian. Uh, and a great guy and a great police officer today that he became. And um, it was just that in that department, th back then, even in 77, it was, they were teaching us more than just tactics and equipment. They, they, to they started telling us a little bit about things that, that can happen and what we could see. Now, it was wow. still the suck it up time. You know, there wasn't any, you know, any you know, counseling after a bad call. And Rich and I responded on a call one o'clock in the morning of uh, right up the street from the firehouse. It was right around the corner from the chief's house. So he was the first on scene, a pickup truck, the, one of the old Chevy pickup trucks that had the gas tank right behind the driver's door, the gas filler and um, skidded, overturned and in, was engulfed in flames. And the, the driver was trapped inside. And uh, wow. chief is screaming on the, you know, we got toned out. And I was there, uh, Rich had slept over that night. So it was two of us and the driver uh, that we knew, a, a nice guy who was one of, one of the mentors that helped us. Um, we just took off with the three of us. He said, one of you get up front because we're just, we're going now. The chief's screaming for it. And that thing was going and, and we got there. We didn't, he said, there's no time to lay in the line. Just take the tank and, and do it. And so together we, we knocked that fire out just as EMS arrived so we could get the victim out. Uh, but it was terrible because when we got there, he was still screaming. And um, wow. it, we, we did what we did. We had to do. We did our job. Uh, uh, one of the other volunteers lived the street, came up in bare feet, and he reversed, laid a line to the hydrant so we could have more w water. And a couple other guys showed up. And we did what we had to do. We cleaned up. We packed the hose, went back to the station. I ran. I took off my bunker coat, still wearing my bunker pants, went into the 
locker room and puked my guts out, was crying and just, you know, throwing up and stuff like that. Washed my face, kind of cleaned myself up, came out. And the driver who, that, that, that driver said, uh, he says, are you okay? And I said, uh, I don't know, I guess. He says, this call? And I said, yeah, he goes, we'll suck it up. That was the sum, that was the sum total of my behavioral health experience after that call. But it's the one call that Rich and I talk about every time we're together. Every time we go over everything. Did we do it right? Did we do the right stuff with what we had? Wow. Stuff like that. And it, it still haunts me. Uh, every once in a while, I'll have a, 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 I don't have nightmares often, but that's one of the ones I do have, is that we don't get there in time. The victim lived for three days in the burn unit, and then he passed. Um, and we can't pass judgment on that. But it, it, would, it troubled both of us for, for a long time. And the fact that here we are some 40 years later, that it's still one of, one of the first calls that we talk about whenever we're together. Right. And I think that we have to encourage the fire service to move beyond just tactics in the academy or in training to the behavioral health and mental health initiatives and lifestyle initiatives. Uh, you know, I used to think I was chubby at, at 10. That's the first time the doctor, pediatrician said to my mother, he's chubby. And I stayed that way till 2017. In 2017, I was close to 240. Wow. And uh, I said, this is not good. This is not good. So I made a decision. Uh, my, wife, my wife and I made a decision together. And um, I just have a lose weight more efficiently than she does. Uh, often, often case between men and women. It's, it's, we're not unique in that, in that case. And over the course right. of the next five months, I dropped 40 pounds. Uh, then dropped a few more. So I was down to about, I got down to about 175 and I was happy with that. And then, as I mentioned, you know, when I was sick last month, I, I, you know, I lost another, uh, you know, 15 pounds, but you know, that wasn't intentional. That was a byproduct of being ill. But I, I feel, it's funny, just last night, I, I'm looking at my arms and I say, oh my God, I can actually see my veins. If they're not buried in, in fat, I, I can see them all over my arms. I can see him on my body and I can see him on my legs. I never could before. It was just skin. That, you know, and when somebody, you know, a nurse or a phlebotomist was going to do a stick, I just knew that when you put the tourniquet on, they'll find, I mean, just like I did. When I put a tourniquet on somebody, I would find the, the right vein right. to make the stick. I never thought about what they had to do. They had to get through that fat to hit that vein right, the right way at the right angle. And I said, God, it must have been a challenge with all the surgeries and stuff I've had. I must have been a real pain in the ass to all the phlebotomists <laughs> and, and nurses who had a, and doctors who had to do those sticks. I said it had to be difficult. I can't imagine being doing having to do that on somebody that obese and yet let the training kick in that you do it the right way. But the fact is, as right. you said, we have the ability to. And as you said, it, it is very sad. I, there was a. On social media, the other, after we got off the phone, there was a post of a fire. I forget where it was. Good knockdown. There was a big fire. Good knockdown. They had several pictures from the fire ground. And one of them was a captain in a helmet who just, all you saw was from, from the neck up. But you could see he was morbidly obese. And, I, I, and every time I see that now, it, it's like a pin. I'm sticking a pin in me. Another one. What can we do? to teach that firefighter to reduce his health threat by being more careful with his lifestyle, eating healthier, doing a little exercise. And, and that, I'm, you know, I'm so happy for the people that we've mentioned, we've talked about for what they're doing, and hundreds more that are doing it too. But we have a very slow trickle-down effect That's right. into the fire service because of our nature. Our nature. Well, I also, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Steve. No, go ahead. Yeah. But I, I think there's, um, there is a, an actual, like, uh, barrier, I, I would say, to education, which is that um, there's no, nobody's dictating that we have to do this. Like the military. The military says you have to make weight, you know, and if you miss it once, twice, three times, you're out. 
So in the military, I have to make weight still to this day. Um, you know, it was the same enlisted and officer. You don't get any, you don't get any benefits as being an officer. Um, and so I think that um, there is nobody dictating that to the fire service. I think some departments on their own have adopted that, but from a national level, that doesn't exist. But there is one thing that does exist. Uh, well, there's two actually. Um, the PSOB, which is the Public Safety Officers Benefit Act, uh, which is a, a congressional act that pays out money if you die on duty. Right. It, it used to only include basically trauma, but now it includes as a, I think as of 2000 and uh, was it three, and then maybe updated in 2013 or something like that. But it now includes heart attack and stroke. So from a federal standpoint, the the federal government will pay. It's like over three hundred fifty thousand dollar benefit to a firefighter who dies from heart attack or stroke, that alone should be enough to mandate at least education on how to prevent heart attack or stroke in any training situation. They don't pay out right now for cancer or suicide. Um, it may eventually go to that that way. I know on the local levels, like state levels, there's some, there's some laws being put in, but from the federal level, there's not. But at least from the heart attack and stroke standpoint, that's your shoe in the door. So you can say, look, the federal government has to pay out this money if a firefighter dies on duty, we need to help prevent that um, because then you have this other organization, OSHA, says their number one mandate for employers is that you need to teach your employees what they need to know in order to prevent injury, illness, or death in the workplace. So if you put those two things together, those are two federal entities that are saying, okay, if firefighters die from heart attack or stroke on duty, that's, a, that's an issue. That's a federal issue. And then OSHA is saying you have to prevent these things from happening. And, and the, other than, uh, you know, the, the other topics of cancer and suicide, those aren't really mandated. You'd have to adopt that as a, as a department. We do know that the IFF, the NFFF, and the NFPA, they all have published guidelines. And each one of those entities, all three of those big entities, um, they all say that fire departments should educate that they should provide wellness programs and they should do research on this stuff. So that's three national fire organizations all saying these three things. Uh, OSHA says you have to at least educate. And then NIOSH, which does all the investigations, they say that you should at least have wellness programs based on what they're seeing, based on the data that comes in for these firefighter fatalities on duty. Um, their number one recommendation is to have medical screenings and, you know, Todd LaDuke is kind of picking that up on, you know, on the front end. Their number two uh, recommendation is wellness programs because so many firefighters that die, so many of these fatality reports that they do are because of some firefighter being either morbidly obese or some really out of normal range health issue that caused the death. It's not the fire service causing the death. And so there's a lot of publications out there that are giving guidelines they're not mandating it, except for those two that I mentioned, that they are saying, you know, heart attack and stroke are a serious issue. And that, and that could be the foot in the door for the fire service to say, look, we have to at least cover these topics. And here's the catch, Steve. If you at least cover preventive issues for heart attack, you're going to hit, you're going to overlap on a lot of the other stuff from cardiac and mental health. Right. I'm sorry, from cancer and mental health, because a lot of that stuff, a lot of that lifestyle um, research says that. The stuff that you do to prevent cardiac issues will prevent cancer and, and mental health issues as well. That's an important fact. That, that's not one I heard before. And that, I th I'm glad to hear that. Um, and I think that, um, I know our time is limited today. And, I, and as it's, we said it the other day on the phone, it's probably going to be a multi-podcast multi uh, effort with you. But uh, I think that we've, you've, we've picked out a couple of key issues that need to be addressed. And then I think maybe on the, on the next time when you come back that we need to talk about ways to make that, that trickle down effect that how do we influence our both. And I also want to throw in that the NVFC has also come on board the National volunteer fire council, uh, trying to give guidance for volunteer departments about health issues for volunteers of part pay paid on call, whatever. Um, and uh, I also think that, you know, one of the big questions in the volunteer side, and I'm hoping to reschedule an interview with the, uh, the uh, 
the executive director of the NVFC. We had one scheduled and then I got sick, but uh, that um, how do we, with them as well, bring them into that same fold? Because we know that uh, out of the 1.2 million firefighters in, in the United States, over 70% are volunteers or part pays. Right. And we know that having been in two volunteer departments, uh, and Howard County has both career and volunteer departments in Maryland, um, we, we know that the education and support structures between career departments and volunteer de departments are different. And we understand why, because there's not as much money, there's not the tax base to have a, a good office, civilian office group there, educators there all the time to help with that. But I think that they're now on board to help with these key issues of the cancer initiative and the health initiative. We have great guys like Chief Dan Kerrigan, Captain Jim Moss, uh, Aaron Zamzow, and a bunch of others out there who are constantly, you know, Jim Moss just, just, Jim Moss just published his new book on being a successful firefighter. And Dan and, Dan and Jim worked on their great firefighter physical fitness book. And Aaron has podcasts and, and videos all over the internet and all over social media about simple things you can do at home. You don't have to own a gym. You don't have to go right. to a gym. There are things you can do at home and still be a fit firefighter. If you, if you do your, these exercises and, and watch some dietary things, you can be a fit firefighter. And he has a contest every January. So he'll, he'll be back probably on another podcast in January to announce his new contest. And he's had people who have lost up to 100 pounds in, in his program uh, just yep. because they heard about it and they listened. And this was stuff they could do on their own. And uh, yeah. I just think that probably in, in, this, in, our, in our next meeting together, we need to see what we, can, what we can do to help both career and volunteer departments using the national organizations. And maybe that's where we need to start is we need to speak to them and with them to tell them how important these issues are today. We're not, listen, we're, we're not just firefighters anymore. We wear multiple hats. We do fire, we do rescue, we do hazmat, we do injury, we do EMS. We, we, we're jacks of all trades now. But when you're a jack of all trades, you're really a master of one. That's right. So you need to, we need to help our people at the basic level, which is you can be a great firefighter or a great paramedic, but if you're not taking care of yourself, and this is how pot, Todd's podcast opened and ended, and we'll close this one because I know our time is limited now, and we didn't even get the break. We just, the conversation flowed, and that's great, and that's important to me, that we take this this new informational block and bring it to the national organizations and be willing to help them trickle it down to our departments. You know, yeah. I think that's, that's the key because, you know, especially with our volunteers, um, they, their time for training is limited. Our whole society has changed since I was a volunteer. I mean, you know, in most, a lot of families today, both parents are working full time. Uh, one might be working a second job, both might be work, working two jobs, and the kids, and after school, and the house, and bills, and everything like that. Yet we still have to find a way to tell these people, you can do all that, and you can still be an emergency worker, but you have to be, try to be a healthier emergency worker. Absolutely. And, and, and one of my jokes that I, I uh, tell people is that, you know, firefighters and EMTs and emergency workers in general um, are like lifeguards of the land is what I like to say. And I, I challenge anybody to look online and, and find images of an obese lifeguard. I've tried this, Steve. I've looked, I've Googled this and it's hard to find. Uh, it's not hard to find images of obese firefighters. They're everywhere. Um, why is that? Uh, I, I know a little bit is because of age, right? Lifeguards don't normally serve until they're 50 or 60. So you get a little heavier as you age. That's fine but you don't necessarily have to become obese as you age, right? And so I think, um, you know, part of 
getting the trickle down to uh, the the firefighter level is helping organization, fire organizations, fire stations, fire departments, giving them something, whether it's a template or um, or an educational curriculum that they can use. Most most departments don't have the resources to just develop a curriculum sure. on the fly. And as it currently stands, I haven't really identified a curriculum on the national level. The IFF has a few courses that they deliver, but you have to pay for them. They, and no offense to the IFF, but they become very expensive for a smaller department when you want to take their course on peer support or, you know, resilience or whatever. And you have to shell out seven or $10,000 for somebody to come in and, and teach, you know, the course at your department. There's got to be a better way to do that. And I know the NFFF, one of the projects I'm working on is a book with them to uh, just post online, a, a open source manual that fire departments can use to say, hey, here's what we can look at. Here's what we can take from this curriculum and, and maybe, you know, chunk it down a little bit for our folks. Maybe we don't have to do a two day or a three day or, or a five day training course. Maybe we can do a two hour, but we can pull from this open source manual and and use that to teach some of our folks. Um, Dan Kerrigan's book is a great book. Even uh, Todd Duke put out a book that he edited, but all those books you have to pay for, they're not open source. So what is the department gonna do that needs to teach a few guys? They, do they buy $25 books for 50 folks or 10 folks or whatever? What if they don't have the money for that? Sure. You know. So um, I think there has to be in the, and I'm not against anybody making money by the way. Um, I think that's a good thing. I think entrepreneurship is good. I think capitalism is good. I think, uh, I do think the fire service needs um, a little bit more access to data and it needs to be a little easier. And we have the folks like, I call them the rock stars. Most people know all the quarterbacks in the NFL, but they don't know these rock stars that are finding out this data like uh, Dr. Denise Smith or Dr. Gavin Horn or Dr. Sarah Janke. They don't know those names, you know, unless they've been to the conferences. But those are the folks coming up with all this good data for firefighters at the ground level. How are we getting it to the ground level? It can't just be from you and I talking, Steve. Right. It has to be something that's more accessible, that's going to stand the test of time, that's going to live somewhere in a, in a good format. That could be the NFFF. It could be the IFF. could be the NFPA. But right now, most places don't have something that is accessible to the firefighter level. So we're, the NFFF is trying to build that. Um, I'm, I'm one of a few people that are working with them to, to build something that will be accessible and open source. But I know there's other folks out there that are now going out and getting degrees in whatever they're studying to bring information back to the fire service. And that's a beautiful thing to see. We're, we're seeing more of that now than, than ever before. And so I think um, as time goes by the next five years, we're going to see, uh, you know, more advocates in, in the fire service that are learning about these issues and bringing it back to the ground level. Um, because as I mentioned before, right now, there is no mandate really, uh, for weight limits or for self care issues. There's just suggestions. There's just guidelines. But as more advocates exist at the ground level, it'll start to, I think, trickle down. But, uh, you know, podcasts are one way to get it out. Books are another way. I think open source material is a great way. You know, free material is a, is a great way. And I think that, um, we also have to do a better job in the fire service of, um, defining buzzwords. Uh, health and wellness is this new buzzword that everybody likes to say, but, you know, um, I found in, in my travels that um, if you ask 10 people about what health and wellness means, 10 people will give you a different definition. It's sort of like leadership, you know, it's these buzzwords that, that sound pretty, but people don't know really what it means. I'll, I'll suggest um, or offer a, uh, a definition that Going back to what Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. I think health and wellness are two um, parts of the definition. Health is what we are. When you do a health checkup, you're going to a, a physician so that you can get a, um, some metrics on where you are at at this moment. It's sort of like the particle and the wave, right? Um, wellness is what you did to get there. Wellness is uh, what we repeatedly do, that part of the sentence. So when we say we are what we repeatedly do, that's health and wellness. You know, health is where we are right now. Wellness is what we did to get there. And I think too often we say health care, but what are we doing to prepare people for wellness so that they end up being healthy? Uh, because health doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just occur. You have to do something to get there. And I think 
that's the way I look at health and wellness. And I offer that as a definition. Um, and until we understand that as a fire department, we'll keep blaming the fire service for our health problems because we're not turning it around on us and saying, well, we are what we repeatedly do. My health is because of my wellness or lack thereof. Right. So, um, so I think until we can come up with some conclusions as a fire service as to what this buzzword means for health and wellness, then we're stuck at that very first point. We're going to continue to argue about what health and wellness even means. Um, and then the same thing now, resilience is becoming a big buzzword. We have an issue with that. What does resilience mean? Everybody's talking about resilience. And uh, I don't know that we've defined it really yet um, because you talk to 10 people and resilience seems to mean 10 different things. I have my own opinions on that. And I'm happy to share that if, um, if we have the time. But, um, but I, I see that as a big problem is that, you know, uh, in the fire service, we like to say you can put out a fire 10 ways, and that's true. But if we're defining words 10 different ways, that doesn't help us figure out a, a way to solve a problem. You know, that whole thing about resilience strikes so, uh, so strong with me because, um, number one, as you said, it's ill-defined. Number two, uh, I was, I was very lucky that in my work in the synagogues, um, I had to deal with loss when a member passed away. And everybody said, well, that's the rabbi. Well, sometimes the ritual director or the executive director has to deal with the family as well. And uh, I've sat with hundreds of bereaved families. Um, down, once down here in Florida, um, I started to be uh, asked to officiate with a for the family if they didn't have a, someone to do, you know, a rabbi to do it. And they had heard about me through, through the grapevine. And um, I, to me, what was always important is when I first came down here and I, would, I went to the first couple of funerals, I was really surprised that um, the couple of the funeral homes would just hire a rabbi to do, who had no connection to the family. So he would go into the, the family room like 15 minutes before the service, tell me about your loved one, and then go do a eulogy. And I said, God, I, how do they do that? How can you do that like that? And I, I asked my brother, I called my brother, and I said, uh, you know, is this, do you do it that way? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm always with the family. So I made a habit of, once I was requested, I would, go and spend an hour or two with the family the night before. And I would say, tell me about your loved one and tell me their jokes and what made them laugh and what made you laugh. They said, why are you going to do that in eulogy? He said, I don't do a eulogy. I do a celebration of life. I, I don't want to talk about their last six weeks when they were ill. I want to talk about who they were as a person. Right. And I, I'm lucky to say that in the last 20 years, there probably hasn't been a funeral I've officiated at where I haven't had people laughing and crying, crying good tears rather than sad tears because of that. Right. But bereavement and loss plays a very heavy role in here. And, you know, as a new kid in 77, when my first CPR case and I was doing banging that chest and we lost the victim, I was inconsolable. It just, I, I, I said, I did, it was my fault. I, I must have not been doing CPR right. You know, I was doing the count with the second person. I was doing everything I'd been taught. But to lose that first patient was just a disaster. And, you know, there was no, you know, somebody you know, pat me on the back and said, you did a good job, Steve. You're good but that didn't assuage my inner, who I was and what I was going through at the moment. And we have a PSA that I play on, on almost every podcast about uh, first respond behavioral health. And one of the, I close with is I know about it because I've been there. I went, I went for counseling because I knew where I was in a bad spot and I went for help and it was only a couple of months and I never had to go back again because I learned so much about myself in that session. I didn't uh, initially, yes, it was very difficult to make that phone call. But I didn't feel weak. I just felt that I needed this for myself and for my family around me. And then anybody else around me, I would be better for it because of anybody else around me. 
And I think we're missing that right. in the fire service too. We need to know that with what we see and what we do, the trauma, the loss that we see, we have to be able to be there to support. Now, we have peer support groups now, thank goodness, and, um, and incident stress debriefing teams uh, have become more commonplace in larger departments, um, maybe regional for volunteer areas. But we need those because we need to do a debrief, not just when we, as soon as we get back to the firehouse, because it's, it's not right then. We're still, the adrenaline's still flowing. We have to do right. that debrief a week later and say, hey, how are you three guys doing? It was, that was a horrible fire. And we lost three people. And you guys did everything you can. But how are you doing? And of course, today, unfortunately, most firefighters still have the macho image. And I'm fine, Chief. Chief I'm, I'm doing just fine. It was, it was okay. It was a hell of a fight. And I'm doing just fine. But inside, their guts are being eaten alive. We have to get them past that. We don't need the bravado. We need the dedication. That's what's important, not the bravado. Do the best yeah. job you can and love what you're doing. It's not always easy, but give, you, give all of yourself to each call. And then you have to remember that you're human. You go back home. You don't take off, you don't take off a cape in a, in a magic suit. You just go home to your, your family, whether it's your parents, your siblings, your wife, your spouse, your significant other, kids, whatever. You're not a firefighter then. You're, you're a son. You're a father. You're a husband. You're an uncle. You got to be able to be that for that family again. And the only way you can do that is if you lower internally those stressors that you just had on your last on your last call, your last shift. And as you said, thankfully, we're we're making progress, but we need a lot more. And I'm thrilled to hear about this um, this book. And if I can be of any service, we're talking about bereavement and loss in, counsel in counseling. And I do not have a degree in counseling. It's just been, you know, since 77, being de dealing with it in families and synagogues. Um, but if I can make any contribution, just call on me. I'm happy to help. Whatever could be done. I appreciate that, Steve. Yeah. It, and as I said, the NFF is, and Triple F is very important to me. Uh, and to this podcast as a whole. So look, I know we're running out of time. You have to run. But uh, this discussion isn't over. Okay? Uh, let's plan after the first of the year to bring you back. Uh, we'll continue the discussion. Um, I'll do a little research on my end. You'll continue what you're doing, all the great work you're doing um, on, on these topics. Uh, I'm glad we, we know, kind of know the same people um, who are doing great things for us in several of the areas. And I think that these people are also the kind who can help us influence the national organizations and show them how important that these services are, that they're just as important as teaching tactics. It's great to have NFPA codes of what the equipment has to look like and what you have to learn, know how to do. But if, if you're not the, a real person doing it, if you're not the whole person with, with your character and your consciousness involved in it, then we're just teaching robots. That's right. You know? Yeah, and, and to, um, real quick, just to defend uh, NFPA, at least them, there are some, um, some standards that they've put out there that do cover both physical and behavioral yes. um, support issues. And so on the, next, on the next time we're together, we can maybe do a deeper dive into that. Good. Um, we can talk, uh, maybe challenge your listeners a little bit about what, what a definition, a proposed definition for resilience can be for, uh, for leadership. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I can, I can offer some thoughts on that if you'd like. Um, and uh, cause I know you cover leadership on your podcast and I, and I think um, we, we need to open up a dialogue in the fire service about, about definitions and what does it mean to be resilient? How do you grow resilience? What does it mean to be a leader? How do you become a leader? Um, and I think people are interested in that type of that, that topic right now. So I'd love to dive deeper into that. That would be you, great. Steve. Very good. I, I was lucky enough to have a, uh, an article published on firehouse.com about how to make a leader. And I, I say we start with it. We treat it like a seed and we plant it just like we get 
pea pods or pepper seeds and you want to grow your own plant, well, you put it in some good earth and you keep it watered and then you see the first sprout. Doesn't mean you you got fruit and you you're going to eat dinner that night from that, but you have to tend to it and and care for it for it to grow and into its environment. And I think leadership can often be the times because some people feel like leaders and some people admire leaders, but they don't know how to make that change to, well, do I really have it in me to be a leader? I don't know. But maybe this talk that we can have in the next thing can help show them that it is possible to grow into leadership. Not everybody's a natural born leader, but people grow and rise to it. And we've seen that even with civilians on the radications, those who run, civilians run to a building with ladders to rescue people uh, before the fire department even gets there. Those are the people who can ri rise to be leaders in that amazing moment. And I think that that'd be a great discussion to have. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. Gamaliel, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and get to know you a little bit on a personal basis. And, um, and I'm looking forward to, the, to our next time. We'll set up something in January after the first of the year. Um, uh, Mazel Tov on the forthcoming arrival. Uh, for thank you. you. And uh, may he, she be, uh, oh, it's, it's she, right, right. So may she yeah. be healthy and well and grow into the house of Israel. And um, that's all we can ask for, right? Thank you. And enjoy uh, your last night of uh, Hanukkah celebration with the family. Yeah, we'll do tonight. Exactly. Thanks so much. Happy Hanukkah. And uh, we'll be back uh, right after these words. Please stay tuned. <laughs>